Alright, so this is the main protest. We've been waiting for it for about a month uh, now. It's been uh, more than uh, 20 days since the last one and it apparently is bigger than expected. So I guess uh, what we can say is let's explore because surely the cathedral media will intentionally lie about almost everything that's going on in the University Square here in downtown Bucharest. So let's explore. It was September the 19th, current year plus five, Anno Trudeau, Bucharest. Unlike Canada, you don't need a license to disagree with the government, although the current Liberal administration tried really, really hard to convince everyone that you do, using the Wuhan cough as an excuse. The problem is that the law disagrees, and no matter how much the panicards scream, basic liberties trump hypochondria and the illusion of security every single time. Organized by the group State of Liberty, the protest was branded We Want Schools, Not Concentration Camps. A harsh title, if you ask me. A title more appropriate for the month of May, when extreme rhetoric was clearly in order, since fewer people had figured it out that the Wuhan cough policies have very little to do with the China virus itself. Anyway, the name State of Liberty is a pun on the names of various policies in place in the country since March, such as the State of Emergency or the State of Alert. <laughs> The organizers set the date on September the 19th in order to leave room for more people to see with their own eyes what trusting the idiots in the government actually means for their children. Five days earlier, the new school year had commenced. In theory, almost three million school children were due to come back to school. In reality, about two-thirds actually did so, the rest of them being forced to stay at home based on more or less bullshit epidemiological data with double-plus bollocks interpretation. Most of the ones that did go to school had to endure utterly insane commencement ceremonies and apparatchik superintendents who only allowed videotaping from the media aligned with the National Liberal Party, part of the same group as Angela Merkel, and most definitely not anyone who thinks for themselves or has the goal to offer a neutral coverage of the panicdemic insanity peddled by the current administration. One week of these policies, the organizers calculated, should be enough to convince more parents and families to show up at a larger protest. To my surprise, it sort of worked. And on top of that, the organizers were also much better prepared, not just with signs, banners, slogans and the usual prop necessary for a protest, but also with signature collection efforts for class action lawsuits and with speakers versed in legal matters and capable of tearing the government a new one in court. Now that was nice. So the day came and people started gathering in December the 21st, 1989 Square, more colloquially known as the University Square, though sometimes known as the Second Tiananmen Square after the September 1991 events at the Minor Strike, and just across the street from the so-called Ground Zero of Democracy. The protest was scheduled to take place here not just because this is traditionally the place where protests are being held, but also because the space in front of the seat of the government, the Victoria Square, where the previous five China virus-related protests were held, was already busy. Some marginal political party had announced a week earlier a five days marathon protest that included the Saturday, with claims ranging from the state of the national forests to reproaches against the government for the management of the China virus situation and to various claims about corruption that made no sense whatsoever. But anyway, it's not that protest that really mattered, and the only reason I'm mentioning it is because someone had the idea to fish protesters from there and send them to the University Square. 
I'm not saying it was a good idea, but it kind of was. <laughs> The cathedral media insisted throughout the day and for the next several days that roughly 200 people attended. Now, you watch the footage and tell me, how much did the cathedral lie? By a factor of two, three, five, more? The organizers claimed uh, during the protest that roughly 6,000 people attended. That is a bit too much, if you ask me. We counted manually in the field three times during the five hours the rally lasted. At the peak, we came up with roughly 2,000 people, 1,973 to be more precise, and roughly 1,000 at its lowest point, 1,009 to be more precise. But counting aside, it was really interesting to watch how much effort the cathedral media put into downplaying this protest. Take these lackeys, for instance, who spent one hour to find this spot to videotape their reporting from. This particular spot allows them a tight enough angle so they can claim basically nobody showed up, but a wide enough angle so they can't be accused they stood too far away from the protest to minimize the crowd, like they did a few months ago, and paid a fine for that intentional lying. This is interesting because the cathedral media has the option to simply ignore the protest altogether. Not being in front of the government's building meant it was already slightly less visible, and at 2,000 people it wasn't big enough to stop the buses on the nearby boulevard. So, what gives? The attention provided by the cathedral media lends credence to the working contention that the politics of the Wuhan cough are still under dispute, largely because the current administration really doesn't want to pay too much for the fallout. It's also the more classical type of politics at play as well. Exactly one week from this protest, the local elections were scheduled, and the job for Bucharest mayor was highly disputed between the kleptocrat socialist and the global homo socialist. In 2016, the kleptocrat socialist narrowly won. This time, the global homo socialist narrowly won. Does this matter? In the grand scheme of things, no, it absolutely doesn't matter. But when the cathedral media is paid for by the government, anything that dissents from the official narrative is a problem, and it makes them nervous. How dare the plebs disagree with the experts? Allegedly, the media is paid for by the state for a few months to inform the plebs about the Wuhan cough. But in reality, it is precisely to push propaganda for the national liberals alongside with the government's version of the Wuhan cough. Nevertheless, these protests show us something else. If you believe we live in a conspiracy, next time come with us at one of these protests and I'll show you why you're wrong. <laughs> For starters, if this were a conspiracy, this protest would have never happened. The police would have cracked down on it under the excuse that the pre-medieval primitivist nonsense of social distancing wasn't properly observed. But that didn't happen, because almost everyone knows that by doing that, the situation would have rolled into a much more complicated political matter. A regime convinced that it had won the politics would have gone forward with that. By the way, the same argument can be made in the United Kingdom, Germany, Switzerland, and basically anywhere in Europe except for Spain. Translation Resistance works. Just saying no, and maybe the occasional fuck off, is enough. Don't believe me? This is what happened when the police told the protesters to go home until there are less than 100 protesters and also told them to wear a muzzle.
That's it. This is the whole incident. After that, the manifestation went on as scheduled. In fact, overall, the police was kind enough to make sure everyone makes it to the protest, as some attendees were on the other side of the building at a square that Google Maps calls the University Square, but it's not the place traditionally dedicated to protests. Again, a police force and a regime fully convinced it won the politics would have gone full force against the dissenters. It didn't because it hasn't won the politics. Quite the opposite, they're in a weaker position than they were in July. Ultimately, the point of these protests is not to make a revolution, but to stop the attempts at one and to network. The real battle is in the courtrooms. The wheels of justice turn slowly, but they always do. That's why you don't need daily or weekly protests. Once per month, or maybe once every three weeks, is usually enough. The downside of this particular protest was the presence of legit loons on the stage. Although much less terrible than the previous iteration, still too high from an optics perspective. If you have the cathedral media around, the opportunity should be used to flatten their nonsense and not to promote a polar opposite kind of nonsense. The only thread where this was done successfully was on the cathedral talking point that the rally was in support of the incumbent mayor. That line of attack fell flat within minutes. Now, while you can't control who comes at the rally and what signs are brought, nor should you police that too harshly, you, as the organizer, can control who goes up on the stage and what is being said. And that's a topic where the organizers still have much to learn. So, to sum up, holding such protests is essential not just for liberty reasons, but also for networking purposes. This is true not just in the context of opposing the Wuhan cough policies, but in general for any activity that involves more than three people and has a lawfare component. Knowing the people you're working with personally is paramount for the success of the project. Relying mostly, or even worse, entirely on electronic infrastructure is supremely dumb. In case you haven't noticed, the dictatorial regime in Belarus started trembling when enough people stopped being afraid. It started trembling when the same happened in Hong Kong. Winnie the flu, by the way, is surely counting his blessings for the Wuhan cough. Taking it to the streets matters. So yeah, resist rebel reproach. Resist the fear of a marginal virus, rebel against the panic-demic policies, all of them either entirely useless or downright harmful, and maintain focus. The enemy is not some shady or shadowy institution. The enemy has names and surnames. Prime Ministers, Ministers of Health, Commanders in Police Forces, School Superintendents, and, yes, disdainful Karens acting as Stasi rats. Those are the enemy. Know their names, keep the lists updated, network, organize, and strike back. That's how you win this. Everything else is distraction noise. Now, if I had worked for the government, I would have personally made sure to bring in as much noise as possible on as many marginal issues as possible. Noise like this, for instance. Or like this one. Although, admittedly, commercial concerns are, in a way, related to the issue. And maybe the holder of this sign was acting in good faith. Still, good faith is a necessary, but not a sufficient condition. That's why reading books is so important. Basic psychology of the masses tells you that bringing in too many claims fragments the crowd and eventually focus is lost and the whole thing fizzles out. 
Want to bring more claims? Make more protests. It's that easy. 20 pro protests with no more than 50 different claims is better than one protest with 20 entirely different claims. And with that, I'll leave it here. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. Visit our website. Support our work because none of this comes free. And um, I will see you all very soon on the Freedom Alternative. Yeah.